mermaid majesty drifting through dreamy depths. Fire in her eyes, love on her lips, desire in her heart. When will you mate? It is your destiny to mate with an outsider, not to love him. You will mate! You will mate! Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there was a magical place full of magical creatures where the children love to read, play, and seek knowledge. Oh look, here's a few young ones now seeking knowledge. Let's take a peek inside, shall we? What the fuck? And I'm sure that's what a lot of the kids and parents thought when they showed up for story time at their local library, but were introduced to Rainbow Dildo Butt Monkey. Promised refreshments at story time, but they received a hell of a lot more than that. And there seems to be no reasonable explanation why a strawberry with what looks like to be a lizard accompanied a monkey with his brassices out, swinging his meat into veg, were hired to read stories to kids aged 3 to 11. And although parents were visibly shaken and outraged, at first the library seemed to think it were a joke. The library, known to be very forward thinking and pushing boundaries. This is a man dressed as a monkey with a pink pillow between his legs. Including having LBGT story time where men dressed up as women read stories to kids and teach about gayness. But I guess this time you could say it all went tits up for the library. And they had to backtrack and apologize to everybody. Which kind of reminds me of when you come home drunk and you get in bed with your girlfriend and you try to stick your dick into her wrong hole. And then when she freaks out, you tell her it was a mistake. It seems the library's doing the same thing. Pushing to see if someone will push back. Hey kid, keep your hand above the equator. In this world, there are things that go beyond our understanding. Things that our tiny minds cannot possibly comprehend. Like when does reality end and dreams begin? Between the flick of a light switch and a dream, we continually shroud ourselves in a veil of illusion. But gay or straight, it's important to note that not all seamen are restricted to being inside of a man's ball sack. Sometimes they can be at sea, braving the high seas and risking their lives every day. What is it about the high seas that strikes fear into a man's heart, where they can be swallowed up at any time? But I guess the same could be said about the seamen in your ball sack. That could be swallowed up at any time as well, well if you're lucky. Case and point. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was the largest ship in the US's fleet at the time. Known as a coal year, the ship's sole purpose was to carry coal. But with the outbreak of World War I, it took whatever cargo the government requested of it, including occasionally transporting troops and even a rescue mission or two. Overall, the USS Cyclops was an all-purpose cargo ship. It was in February of 1918. After a brief stop off in Rio de Janeiro to load up on some cargo, the ship headed out to its final destination in Baltimore, US. But to reach that destination, the ship had to travel through the infamous Bermuda Triangle. It's to be noted that although the Cyclops was designed to carry ore, when it received its cargo in Rio de Janeiro, instead of the standard 8,000 tons it was designed to carry, it took on a load of 10,000 tons. And for whatever reason, this was okayed by the captain. 
all accounts, the captain was a cruel man who ran his ship with a brutal iron grip, punishing his crew for the slightest of infractions, often confining experienced officers to their cabin while inexperienced crewmen carried out important tasks like loading cargo where the positioning of that cargo was crucial and could often affect the balance of the ship in rough seas, with many saying that he was a mental often carrying out his duties walking around the deck, dressed only in his underwears and a British bowler hat, and more than once there had been talk of mutiny, with the crew being pushed by that captain to the limit. There were also accusations that he were a German sympathizer. After all, all his friends seemed to be Krauts or Americans with a German background. But being it was World War I, talk like that was dangerous, and if they talked, not too many people did it loudly. It was on February 20th, that the USS Cyclops made an unplanned stop in Barbados. It was noted that the ship was riding low in the water, confirming that she had way too much ore in her cargo hold. As the ship departed, it sent out a radio message saying that there were smooth seas ahead, and that was the last time that the Cyclops was seen or heard from again. Not even a crackle on the radio. There have been many theories since, most notably that it was German subs, but it was rare, unless lost, for any sub to be out that far. And if it had sunk the Cyclops, it would be a feather in the cap of any U-boat captain who would have definitely reported it back to command. But what about if the captain of the Cyclops, who were rumored to like more than just schnitzel, waited for everybody to go to sleep, radioed in the ship's position, and a sub just walked up and sunk it? It's not that far-fetched if you consider his crew were terrified of him and he regularly locked them in their quarters and all the captain had to do was walk onto a lifeboat and hook up with his German pussy-loving buddies. And although we love blaming it on the Germans, it can't be discounted that the ship was traveling through the Devil's Triangle, which at that particular time in history had laid claim to over a hundred ships. But whatever happened to the Cyclops, there's one thing for sure. She disappeared into thin air and nothing was ever found. No cargo, lifeboats, not even a deck chair. Which is rare in any instances when a ship so large has gone missing. A year after the USS Cyclops had gone missing, the US government did an extensive investigation, at which time they discovered that the captain of the Cyclops the so-called American captain was in fact a German who left a docked German ship in New York and disappeared into the crowd, whose name was Johann Friedrich Whitman. He was as German as a sausage with sauerkraut and probably twice as stinky. A crowd captaining an American ship in a war against Krauts. You can't get more messed up than that. He probably walked right off of his lifeboat onto their sub and they all went and listened to 99 Luft Balloons together. Which is a pretty good song, I gotta say. You fucking soon-to-be Nazi swines. Either way, these are just theories. There's no proof. And the disappearance of the USS Cyclops still remains one of America's greatest maritime mysteries. But not all mysteries are so mysterious. Sometimes the answer can be right there in front of our faces. And yet, we still don't have a clue. Case in point. It was in 2003 that two men mysteriously boarded a jetliner and virtually disappeared. The sun had just begun to set over Quattro de Viviero Airport in Angola's not-so-lovely capital of Luanda. And I say not-so-lovely because it's one of the most corrupt places in the world, where even buying a pack of chewing gum you risk your life. Tribes fighting each other, terrorism, human rights violations, and that's just in the hotel you're staying at. One big fucking shithole. But I guess like all scam-ridden shitholes, if you play your cards right, there's a profit to be made. It was an American millionaire who got the bright idea to buy up an old passenger jet, then gut it, fly it over to Africa, and deliver fuel and supplies to the diamond mining companies and make a killing. But I guess like every other deal in Africa, he got ripped off when he delivered the goods 
They didn't pay him the money. So he abandoned his plane at the airport until he could figure out what to do with it. And a year passed where I gathered dust and millions of dollars of parking fees, sitting in an African airport at the mercy of the scavengers. It was a year later that he hired a mechanic and sent him over to Africa to see what the damage was and if they could salvage the plane for resale. If references are to be believed, Ben Padilla was as clean as a soul on a cripple's boot and could be trusted. And the millionaire told Ben he could hire a bunch of Angolians to help him clean up the plane and get it flight worthy, whom I'm guessing were less trustworthy because this all never happened. And on May 25th, the Florida-based mechanic Padilla and another mechanic from the Congo stepped on a dusty old 727 and started taxiing it down the runway. And although the control tower radioed the cockpit and told them to turn around because they did not have permission to use the airfield, nevertheless, the derelict shipbox of a plane, seemingly against all odds, took off. Bizarrely, neither Padilla or the local mechanic that he hired to help out knew how to fly the plane. What makes it even more impressive is no one knows where they got enough jet fuel to even take the plane off the runway. And with the 727's lights and transponders not working, it's anyone's guess where it was headed. The only thing that we do know is that the Boeing 727 with the tail number NA48AA flew southwest towards the Atlantic Ocean with witnesses reporting that wires were still hanging out at various points on the plane. Meaning there weren't no free drinks and there certainly weren't an in-flight movie. Hey stewardess, my headphones don't work and I need some more fucking peanuts. Fearing the worst, the airport contacted all the American embassies and told them what had happened. And this is when the US military got involved and started trying to track the plane. After all, this was only two years after 9-11, so the possibility of terrorists taking the plane and using it was a distinct possibility. But they found nothing. The plane and its two grease monkeys had disappeared like a brown M&M down a pair of retard shitty underwears. And there'd been enough theories on the plane's disappearance to fill a quadriplegic's colostomy bag. The most popular being that there were already people waiting on the plane and when Ben and his trusty manservant got on, they jumped them. Then at gunpoint, they demanded Padilla show them the complicated procedures of getting the plane started. And then these terrorists took the plane out to the desert somewhere and landed it, hid it under some brush, to use for a future terror attack. Either way, experts believe it will be almost impossible for only two men to fly a 727. And Ben Padilla had very limited knowledge in flying a plane, and certainly not a 727. The FBI closed the case in 2010, figuring that Padilla and his grease monkey buddy crashed the plane in the Atlantic Ocean. Either way, it's an enduring mystery because no one has ever found any wreckage from the plane. And to this day, it's the largest aircraft to ever have gone missing and no wreckage ever found.